IP for this uh, global uh, webcast. Uh, this, my name is Omar Siddiqui with EPRI. I'm Senior Program Manager in our Electrification and Customer Solutions Group. And uh, it's my distinct pleasure to host and kick off this Digital Grid Virtual Workshop, Integrating Customer Resources. Uh, today is day two of our series for this week, and um, we have a very distinguished panel here, and uh, uh, we're very much looking forward to an interactive uh, session. I am um, uh, speaking on behalf of my colleagues uh, at EPRI, including Mark McGranigan, our um, Vice President of Innovation at, at EPRI, uh, who will be uh, making a few remarks, and our distinguished uh, moderator, uh, Maher Chebo, and our distinguished panelists for today and uh, my co our colleagues at Stanford. Before we begin, uh, I did want to make, uh, make one statement and inform you all that our colleagues from Stanford University, who, who have been, as I said, our co-hosts uh, for this week's Digital Grid Virtual Workshops, will not be participating in today's webinar. Like many universities, Stanford is suspending all normal business on this day, including participation in meetings, in observance of the shutdown academia and shutdown STEM uh, movement that has sprouted online over the past 24 hours as an expression of solidarity against systemic racism in society that disproportionately impacts black people in the United States. We fully support the decision of Stanford and others to take this principled stance. Please note that Arun Majumdar of, of uh, Stanford who was to, was to be our keynote speaker today, will shift his remarks to tomorrow's scheduled technology panel webinar, giving us two keynote speakers for tomorrow. EPRI, the Electric Power Research Institute, is unequivocal in its commitment to progress towards a more fair and just society. The tragedy and ensuing events of the past two weeks here in the United States has stirred deep emotions, emotions of shock, grief, and outrage for many of us, our families, our friends, and our colleagues. We acknowledge the pain that many people feel. We applaud constructive efforts to raise consciousness, heal wounds, and create positive change. We ask that you join us now for 30 seconds of reflective silence, and we will proceed with our session. Thank you for your understanding. Thank you. Thank you for your patience. Um, and let's go ahead and get started. A few housekeeping items. Um, all of the, everyone who is an attendee, uh, you're on mute right now because of the uh, number of attendees. Um, there are two ways to interact and ask questions. Um, the uh, recommended method is to submit your questions via chat. So if you look at your web, uh, the panel at the bottom, you'll see a, a chat bubble that's highlighted uh, there on the uh, picture. You can click on that and that will allow you to ask a question and uh, we will be moderating that and we'll uh, refer to that for questions as we go on. You can also identify yourself and raise your hand virtually and we can unmute you if you wish to ask a question verbally, um, but I would recommend the chat feature uh, with your, with your uh, indulgence and understanding. Uh, we are recording this webcast so your participation is your consent to this recording. And we will be posting the recordings as well as the presentations from this particular uh, panel session as well as the other sessions for this week on both the EPRI and Stanford University websites. And that information will be shared uh, to all of the registrants. So our um, objectives for this, uh, for this week um, are to uh, 
present first a vision of a shared integrated digital grid. And this is a concept that um, we have tried to explain in uh, some of the um, description mater descriptive material about this uh, webinar series. Um, but there are a number of different aspects to it. As you see there on the figure on the right, um, part of our, uh, the essence of, of this vision is around enabling the, uh, uh, you know, the, the dispatch of customer cited resources, customer DERs, if you will, uh, in a way that's fully integrated with utility operations and planning to uh, become uh, assets to enable uh, flexibility on the grid and, you know, flexible dispatch. And in that, uh, in that process, there are a number of concepts uh, that are, are related from transactive energy to uh, the implementation of, of AI and in embedded technology, both on the uh, customer side on, uh, on, and devices, as well as um, upstream to the utility. And issues of data security and um, the common information model are all concepts that I think will uh, have bearing in this. But we want to present and exchange ideas of what this vision of a digital grid looks like. And really, uh, to convene here experts uh, literally from around the world to help to um, articulate their visions of this integrated grid and, and digital grid concept, identify their gaps to uh, identify gaps to achieving this vision. Um, we have identified principally this notion of uh, needing to have an enabling data platform as a critical um, uh, enabler to actualize an integrated uh, and digital grid. But we want to discuss that in, in some more depth and, and, and different angles. Also to explain and explore utility requirements and plans from uh, utilities in the U.S. Uh, yesterday and a European perspective here today. And then to discuss technologies, uh, both uh, commercially available in the market as well as some future technology options to help bridge those gaps. Ultimately, what we wish to do, and this is for both our perspective at EPRI and Stanford as the co-host, is to inform a, a robust research roadmap and a collaborative initiative uh, industry-wide to uh, advance along this uh, path to developing an integrated grid. As I said, um, uh, EPRI, I think uh, most people uh, on this call are probably aware, but just to take a minute, uh, we're an independent nonprofit research organization. Uh, we do research on every aspect of utility operations, uh, generation, uh, power delivery, and the end use of electricity for, for a public benefit. And our work is aimed at advancing the safety, reliability, efficiency, affordability, health, and, and uh, environmental sustainability of electric service through collaborative research. Uh, speaking on behalf of uh, our colleagues at Stanford, uh, the Bits and Watts Initiative within the Stanford Precourt Institute of Energy is our co-host. Uh, this is a major Stanford initiative and they're focused, as it says there, on digital innovations for the uh, future electric grid. And they, uh, in, in their multidisciplinary group, advance business innovation, policies, and supporting customer control and end user technologies uh, to recast and rethink the relationship between consumers and the grid. So at the bottom, you see there are shared workshop goal to convene these experts from around the world, including our distinguished panel here, to uh, develop a research roadmap uh, towards developing a standardized data platform that can enable uh, the shared integrated grid vision uh, with, with an aim towards to connecting and interfacing customer distributed resources um, with the grid. Um, and just a, uh, one quick thing before I turn it over to uh, Mark McGranigan. Uh, we do have, um, as I mentioned, uh, a webcast, uh, the third of our This Week series tomorrow, and it's at the same start time, and we will have uh, two keynote speakers. Um, our moderator will be uh, Nicola Peel Molter from VMware, and we have a, another great panel, um, set of panelists. And uh, going forward beyond that, we're very proud to unveil a uh, weekly summer, summer webinar series um, that will begin on July 1st. And these will, again, be 90-minute uh, sessions with, um, uh, you know, looking at various aspects of uh, the digital grid. 
And the first three of these are, are noted here, but we're planning additional ones into, um, uh, into the summer. So uh, there will be more information and the ability to register for these events. So I just wanted to, to make sure that you were aware of that and the postings of these workshops this week, as well as the uh, panel, or as well as the series into the summer will be available on the EPRI and Stanford sites. With that, uh, let me turn it over at, uh, to, to Mark, maybe to say a few words and uh, to say a few words about our, our, our moderator too. So Mark, it's over to you. Okay, Omar, thanks a lot. And uh, I appreciate everyone joining today. We had a very good, good session yesterday with uh, some U.S. perspectives on this topic of digitalization and uh, connected customers and connected communities, which I think is, is one of the uh, you know, top research and demonstration priorities for really understanding the way the future grid is going to work and, and making communities and customers an integral part of that. Um, we've been talking about a concept of an integrated grid for a number of years now. And, and kind of define that as, as making local energy optimization part of the global energy optimization. And, and I think the integrated grid is really all about this challenge of, of integrating um, all the way down to, to smart customer equipment as, as part of optimizing the way the grid operates. It's, it's a huge opportunity and it's really a requirement as we, as we go further in integrating renewables and with increasing need for flexibility of grid operation and through the process of electrification of transport and heat and other elements, um, it's only going to become more important to, to make, make all these pieces work together. I was part of the ETIP SNET working group four that uh, Mahir Chebo and Miguel Sanchez Forney are, are leading, and it's, that's been a, a great focus uh, to, to help bring together thoughts in this space, especially we, we added to, to the, the function of working group four, which is on digitalization. We added the, you know, part of our title of, of, of connecting the customer to, to the function that we're trying to accomplish there. So I'm really delighted to uh, have Mahir kind of leading the panel of a European perspective on this topic today. Uh, I think it, it should be a very interesting discussion. I, I look forward to, to uh, helping out with the questions and I'm sure I'll, I'll help some myself and, and learn from the process. So I think rather than uh, take up a lot of time myself, I'll just turn it over to Meher. Meher was uh, in charge of, of this space of NGE Digital Grid for, for a number of years and uh, now is is headed in in a new venture still close to GE and and helping uh, companies and with their strategy in this space uh, going forward. So we look forward to continuing to work with Mahir and and uh, Mahir, I'll turn it over to you for for the further introduction of the panel. Thanks, Mark. Uh, that's uh, a great opportunity to be here. Fantastic brands, Ipri and Stanford uh, and. Uh, I, I hope you will have uh, another good session tomorrow. I heard that the good session yesterday was really good. Uh, just give me a second. So uh, I uh, I would like to, before I introduce the panelists, um, I would like to just say a few words about the uh, initiative we have in Europe at the European Commission which is around the ETIPSTAT Working Group for Digitalization of Energy. Uh, basically, we have evolved since 2005 when we started looking at the European Technology Platform Smart Grids. We have evolved from a picture which is grid-focused, electricity-focused, to a picture which is more convergent around different sources of energy and different energy networks as well, heating, gas, electric, and so on. Uh, and uh, the ETRISNET, which stands for European Technology Innovation Platform, Smart Networks for Energy Transition, um, has uh, set up a um, few years ago, like two years ago, uh, uh, five working groups who look after the overall energy value chain, Some grid topics, flexible generation topics, batteries topic, and also digitalization topic. 
Now, uh, what we did in this group is uh, uh, drafting what could be our recommendations about the digital technologies as an enablers, about the use cases that the digitalization can bring, and and also we looked at the cybersecurity uh, to make to make sure that you know everything we bring the digital is robust is sitting on the on a robust platform, and and more recently we evolved from drafting uh, recommendations in white papers. We did have like a long one for technical guys, 170 pages available on the ETPSnet portal, and we did have a shorter one for policymakers where we have mainly our recommendations, like 24 pages, to present our point of views. But now we evolved as well, and Mark has been very much active in this into going through what could be a big idea, a big project for Europe. I call it the Airbus of Europe, which could be a digital platform we could build for Europe, democratized, broadly used by the 250 million customers in Europe, and where you could have as simple as Googling, as simple as ordering something on Amazon, for instance, where the consumer who would have a portal who can have access to all the energy services, energy supply, whether they are uh, in the country where he lives or she lives, or whether the other Europeans who could act in his country as well. And that simplicity in accessing the information and ordering things and having the activation of the services or the services delivered in one click to the customer that's easy to say, very complex to implement. We have seen it in telecom. Telecom have made, have made a lot of interoperability connections between the systems that at the end is extremely simple for any customer in Europe to change things, to order things in telecom services. And we want to come to that stage. So this is the latest work we have been uh, doing. We went through uh, a uh, a scouting and funneling of different ideas from the group. Mark's idea was one of them. And then we came to shape uh, that into a proposal where we have had at least two or uh, more interactions with the European Commission to see how we can execute on that big idea as an ambitious project for Europe. Now, I'm uh, delighted to stop here the introduction about the ETIPSNAT at this stage and go through the uh, presentations from the different panelists. Uh, the structure would be the uh, following. So we will have uh, a 10 minutes presentation, uh, particularly with slides from the uh, panelists, followed by like two minutes questions. And then I will open it in the last 20 minutes for a dialogue among all the panelists here with the, uh, after hearing everyone uh, presentation, uh, going through uh, the uh, learnings and uh, recommendations, and uh, then a conclusion at the end. I will start by uh, Miguel Ponce de Leon. Uh, Miguel will be speaking about the service-based architecture for IoT, uh, and uh, will be uh, speaking about a, a European Horizon 2020 project. So. Uh, GNO uh, project, uh, and I think this will be at the beginning uh, setting up the scene as well, speaking about a uh, highly uh, uh, technology-focused project around the IoT that uh, is very much in the context of the DSOs, distribution system operators, or what we call as well DNOs, distribution network operators, and then we will go through the other two presentations uh, one from Etienne uh, Guéhin, uh, works at NG, and finally Peter uh, Soderstrom works at Buttonfall. Uh, the experience of NG digitalization is an interesting one, and the experience about the digital hub uh, uh, at, at Buttonfall and the strategy to build foundation for digital grid at Buttonfall is also an interesting one. So let me start by uh, Miguel uh, Ponce de Rion. The floor is yours. Mahat, thank you very much for handing over. So hopefully my audio is coming through for you and all the participants. So thank you very much for taking your time to, to come and uh, have a chat about the digital grid. A great pleasure to be part of this particular uh, event. And I'm going to get into my presentation uh, 
quite quite rapidly here. Uh, just to give you some context, uh, Sanyo, which is the name of the project, means dream. And you're finding us in a project that has uh, 13 partners across Europe. As was suggested, there are both uh, DNOs, uh, DSOs, so it's called, and TSOs also part of this particular project. And very much looking at, when we talk about service oriented grid, we talk about you know, a service platform a digital service platform in order to be able to also use the network of the future to be able to deliver in the digital grid space. So I'm going to take uh, a few minutes to go through my slides uh, if I go the right direction. <laughs> um, the context for this project, it, it has been running for the last uh, two years. So it's actually been underway for the last two years. So uh, what was informing the project is the, this uh, idea of, or this happenings of grid resilience. Um, I live in Ireland. I live in the southeast of Ireland, which is out on the western coast of Europe. We get hit by a lot of storms coming in from the Atlantic Ocean. And this has significant impact. You can see up to uh, 5,500 damaged overhead lines. So hundreds of kilometers lines of, uh, uh, of, of electricity being distributed across uh, Ireland. Uh, that much damage, 385,000 homes and businesses out of electricity, and essentially 665 million customer minutes lost over storm Ophelia alone. This is having a significant impact uh, on the grid. And so this was really uh, an initial part of informing the team of coming together to look at, well, how could we uh, essentially uh, work better with putting digital as, as an element to help us in this. Now, there are other challenges, and I, I'm not going to have to go into too much detail here, the, the, the normal challenges around storage of electricity, about the uh, renewable energy sources and how, um, how they are predicted or more predictably added to the grid, and also the mobility of electricity through electric vehicles we can see in Ireland is certainly having an impact on how ESB networks, who are the DSO here in Ireland, uh, can essentially manage their network and how it's impacting their network. So the distribution of generated electricity is having a big impact. So complexity is the key thing. The key point here is that it's becoming a much more complex network. And so, so this set the objectives for our two and a half year project, Sanyo, looking to enable smart operations on the grid, being able to unlock grid automation, and to be able to better get better uh, asset utilization, especially when you're looking at bringing renewables into your low voltage and uh, medium voltage areas, especially low voltage, how to better get better utilization and how to build up system awareness so that you can start to become uh, and act upon uh, accurate and fine grained data to make secure planning and secure use of your network. These are some of the key goals uh, of the project. And in order to deliver on that, we've had four uh, essential pillars uh, to the project and essential ingredients to it. The inclusion of low cost PMUs and, and advanced PMUs onto the grid, about bringing cloud virtualization, and this will be a, a major part of the topic when I talk about the architecture that we've used to be able to in integrate both cloud and edge cloud into the delivery of a number of services into the uh, grid space. Uh, to be able to use 5G wireless communications and be able to lab test its use with software defined radios uh, in a grid scenario. And finally, to be able to use machine learning to be able to do data analytics based on deep learning of the network and the data that's coming up from all of these low cost uh, sensors and devices and be able to apply these to specific services. So the rest of the presentation is going to take you through a couple of these topics and help to tackle them in the Sanyo project. Uh, the first one around 5G, I mean, 5G hasn't been fully standardized yet. Uh, there are still elements that are to be built in. But for the Sanyo project, we really wanted to look at the low latency. The low latency was certainly as applicable to looking at frequency control on the grid. Low latency is essential. A communication platform to support that as needed. Uh, edge cloud, again, is very much uh, an element, an architecture of 5G and how we can re use that within the grid space. Uh, network slicing, which essentially allows your IoT devices to have a separate network uh, within a network, uh, separated from all the normal multimedia uh, and searching tools that no, most people will be using on their mobile devices compared to the IoT devices, which are taking important data up from the network. 
a bit to rely on the reliability and security of 5G and how this integrates with our grid solution. What's been really big in Sanyo as well is being able to take innovative algorithms and monitoring approaches, ones that are in research and essentially sometimes in math lab, and being able to bring this towards the data that's being uh, provided by ESB networks and being able to apply it and see how it will help the grid. And also being able to show a DSO and DNO how machine learning tools that are existently there can be parsed and used over the large amounts of data that are already being gathered by the DNO and how to give you advanced analytics on this information. Again, being able to visualize key performance indicators uh, have been an essential part of being able to show how Sonyo, when using network codes, for example, interconnecting both from uh, the um, high voltage to the medium voltage and also through your low voltage uh, areas, uh, how to be able to keep visualizations on these KPIs has been a part and part of the project. Here is a, a, an example of the architecture that we've developed on within the Sanyo project. And just to highlight that, you know, it, it, while it looks simplistic, that's the key part, I think, of any type of architecture. That it's simple to explain, but does solve a number of issues. And I'm going to start at the top where it comes to visualization. You know, being able to visualize all of this data we found very early on is really important. Um, but we did find that there's many different devices and many different connectivity management elements to the data that comes in. So having an integration bus uh, is an important element of all of this. Um, you can see service one to service N, and I will explain these in the follow-up slides where I'll talk about um, uh, power quality and I'll talk about FLISR resources. But just to show other parts of the, the architecture that are important, uh, databases, both from uh, the perspective of having um, time series data as well as rational and uh, databases, both are actually needed uh, within the architecture and you need to be able to integrate both. Using your communications, 5G being a key item, and then obviously the electrical grid and being able to interconnect to it has been an important part. You do see labels there talking about Docker. Being able to deploy on the cloud, I have to state one of my big points for this presentation is being able to use Docker, Docker containers, a software system in order to contain what you build and be able to deploy it, whether you're using Microsoft Azure or cloud, uh, Google Cloud or AWS or any other type of cloud provider, I think having Docker and Docker containers has been one of the big uh, revelations in, in our deployment. As I suggested earlier, I was going to cover a little bit about the actual services themselves. We broke them out into system aware services, like uh, state estimation, power quality, and power control, and also moving towards autonomous self-healing. We really wanted to look at this topic, and looking at fault, location, isolation, and service restoration has been an important part. Being able to look at those storms when they come in, being able to identify where the faults are, being able to send the crews out in a timely manner, it has been really, really important. I've been able to show how we can build algorithms to help us in this has been a big part of Sanyo. Just to show you the field trials within this project is based right across Europe from Ireland, where I'm based, and we've done a number of field trials uh, there, but also in Germany, in Aachen. We've also been in Estonia and also in Romania. So we've been reapplying some of the algorithms to be generic enough to be applied a num across a number of different scenarios. And this was also really important for us to show that the architecture could stand up. What we've really found is when you look on the right, at the left hand side of this particular slide deck about the conventional approach, I think most of you would know SCADA systems, would know ADMS systems that are in place and measurement devices. And you know, I think the industry has been used to single vendor product procurement cycles. And certainly what we found with building out Sanyo and dealing with a number of DSOs, that it's going to become a multi-vendor environment where service procurement is going to come to the fore. And you're going to have to have a digital platform that's going to be able to support that. So there's going to be multiple algorithms and multiple implementations that you need to be able to bring in. There's going to be multiple supplier, suppliers and multiple devices. And you need to have a, a, a slide deck to be able to, or a, a, an architecture that's going to be able to support that. Um, I'm nearly there with the slides. I have two more, so just pair with me for a second. Although I'm not going to go through each word on this slide, but I think you can see where we view today's distribution grid, where we see the next distribution grid having more accurate sensors, more monitoring data, more conventional algorithms, where the future distribution grids, where they're going to be more open, more distributed. So we have to have a scalable and modular IoT set of platforms and digital platforms in order to be able to, to support that. 
Uh, just to say that in Ireland itself, we did test both the flitter, the power quality and the state estimation um, services. And we reused data that was already available within ESB networks. We deployed some new sensors and were in more intelligent about where we deployed those sensors. There were times when it would have been nice for the algorithm to have 200 sensors deployed within a 100 mile radius. It just wasn't economically feasible to do so. And so being able to be more intelligent about how many sensors and where we placed them, but still had the granularity of being able to have the machine learning algorithm still provide us with insights that became a very important item. Okay, I've probably taken enough time with my sets of presentations. I'm open for questions uh, and also happy to, to receive anything in the Q&A section too. Thank you. So don't worry, we we are ahead of time because the introductions were short at the beginning. Just uh, questions here on the on the five G. Do you believe the use cases you have implemented here on five G are among the uh, today the pilots or the most advanced, for example, in uh, oh, Europe? Absolutely, because look, we've had access to the uh, uh, Ericsson have been one of the partners in the project. Uh, and their uh, eNode Bs, so the actual uh, devices for 5G, they are fresh out of their R&D labs. Uh, so being able to gain access to that technology to be able to test what we'll be doing with our digital grid, has, has, uh, there's very few or next to know that I know of that have done such tests. Okay, and if, if you can like summar, summarize like one, two, three things um, between without 5G, the way from these OT systems, SCADA systems and so on and the measurements, we, how we were collecting the data through which communication channels and why the yeah. price is bringing extreme value. Yeah, so, so the, big, the big word, I'm going, to, I'm going to start with the word distributed. And you know, beforehand, everything was centralized. Everything was cent essentially centralized. Centralized dedicated links, centralized computing systems. Um, what we've shown through Sanyo is that you can reuse the value of the internet. Remember, the value of the internet is distributed systems, disparate connected elements, but you're able to bring them together to give you intelligible insights. That, for me, has been the key thing. And being able to show somebody like ESB Networks, who are a DSO, that you can transition towards that world of a distributed digital solution. Because again, they would have had a worry that how, how can we move towards this type of uh, technological roadmap, this technological architecture. And we've been able to show through Sanyo that you can do this step by step. It doesn't have to be a one big bang solution, that there are ways you can tr transition different services and different elements of your network uh, to, to, to move you towards this architecture. So did, did you make some calculations about the cost? What's more cost effective in terms of like network operations, implementing the 5G with these distributed control, distributed communication versus what we do today? I couldn't. Now, there is a report that we have from, from some of the, the partners in place. Now, I don't have it to hand, but we were able to show that, look, since you're um, leveraging, um, we'll say, um, cloud computing services, so you're not having to have dedicated uh, elements built for you. You have to re-leverage services that are kind of uh, commodity-based uh, services. That immediately uh, essentially drives down your costs on some certain parts of what you would have been spending on before. Um, so again, the key proof for us is that you were able to use these commoditized uh, products, these co commoditized um, services uh, within your digital grid solution. Uh, now, we do have some key data around this, and we do have a report that gives you, with we'll a deeper analysis uh, on, on what I've just kind of given you an antidotal overview of. Mm -hmm. Hey, Maher, could, could I ask a question? Sure, of course. Yeah, this is Mark, Mark McGranigan. Hey, hey Miguel, the, the, this is a very interesting project. And yesterday we had a, a really good presentation from, from uh, John Hughes from Ameren talking about private LTE applications for managing uh, the distribution grid. And that, that's gaining a lot of... Uh, a lot of support. Matter of fact, ESB Networks is one of the ones really interested in that technology. I know this project kind of focused on 5G, but is uh, does does private LTE as a as a communication infrastructure um, fit as a starting point for for implementing some of this uh, service oriented architecture? It certainly does. I mean, you can see me nodding my head here as. You know, essentially, look, we, we would have also put in part of this, you know, your cloud infrastructure that's in behind. So the, the radio head end of having private LTE is, again, a way of transitioning you towards being, then being able to use 5G when it's fully available. 
Um, of course, you don't strictly have network slicing as you have to do it in a specific way with private LTE. Uh, it's more readily available when you have it through 5G. But again, you can basically see how it's going to fit into your roadmap in the longer term. But any of the way that we've done the Flitter, the power quality and the state estimation services are still developed in the same way. The platform that you're putting in your cloud environment, it can still be done in the same way. Any other question, uh, Etienne, Peter, or Omar uh, would like to ask? No, okay. and uh, uh, I'm monitoring the uh, Q&A. Uh, no other questions submitted so far, so um, we can go ahead and continue. Thank you. So uh, uh, the, the last one from my side is, what is the next step uh, for this? Of course, this is big on the agenda of uh, telecom digitalization, the European Commission, the 5G is really a big thing and there is a lot of expectations out of it. Uh, what, what is the next step after this Sonio project? So funny enough, we've just started it. So we just kicked off the follow on project uh, in, uh, in April. So the 1st of April for this year, which is about flexibility in the grid and how once you have better monitoring on the grid, once you have a little bit better control over what's happening on your grid, that you can or, or offer more flexibility. And what I mean by flexibility is offering of other renewable sources onto your grid and how you will be able to distribute that. And that's a okay. project that we call EdgeFlex. And it's been able to broker both the financial side of that as well as the physical distribution of that, that energy. Um, so that, that is essentially where all of our team are now heading towards as a follow-on from, from, from this work in Sonia. Perfect, thank you. We'll come back to you then uh, in, the, in the last uh, section of the, of the uh, panel when it comes to the uh, discussion across all the panelists. Uh, let, let me jump now to Etienne Guéin, uh, who works at ENGIE as a Chief Digi uh, uh, as a Digital Innovation Officer. Uh, he will be talking about the Digital Transformation Strategy at ENGIE. We have seen uh, some announcements about big investments uh, by NG on the digitalization. We have seen a number of projects and so on. We are very much keen to listen to where is NG today and uh, what have been achieved and the next plans. So Etienne, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. <clears throat> I hope you hear me well. Um, yes. You hear me? Okay, good. Um, I'm delighted to, to be here in this panel and thank you for the invitation and for the opportunity. So uh, maybe a couple of words of context. Uh, you, you alluded to uh, Maher about NG. Uh, we, we are uh, uh, essentially a, an independent power producer and a retailer. Uh, we have very, very little uh, uh, network activity in electricity. Of course, in gas, we are major there. But uh, today, uh, I'm, I'm going to speak uh, as a retailer, essentially. Um, so, as you said, Maher, uh, NG recognized the need to operate some transition and to go towards the uh, energy transition uh, a couple of years ago. And we started uh, by uh, disinvesting in, from our uh, centralized power production uh, capabilities, um, essentially moving out of coal power production but also uh, many gas power production that were less and less uh, uh, profitable. Um, overall, we wrote off about 15 billion euros of our assets, uh, which of course showed on our uh, uh, share price heavily, as you can imagine. Uh, but at the same time, uh, uh, we also divested and reinvested about the same amount, uh, 15 billion, into new assets, uh, and some of which are digital assets, uh, digital platforms, ways to interact with uh, our customers. Uh, and the fact is that um, we recognize that we were no longer going to supply all the electricity that our customers were going to need. Some of them uh, would be produced locally, but uh, uh, that didn't mean that we we had to disappear from the picture, of course, and we wanted to service our customers uh, with 
offerings, uh, and uh, caring about their new needs, uh, caring about their their assets, uh, what they wanted to do with it, uh, what they wanted to exchange possibly with uh, uh, neighbors or how they wanted to interact with the grid. So with this context, what I tried to do is to show how we thought about uh, all this with a um, picture showing that uh, it it is about technology, uh, technical sophistication, uh, but it is also about business modeling uh, and uh, customer engagement. You have to find the sweet spot between those three dimensions. And I, I didn't put their regulation because regulation appears everywhere from a grid code to uh, uh, market organizations and so on. So um, starting with each, uh, starting, sorry, with uh, technology, I will go uh, in, in all dimensions showing what we have experimented and, and uh, 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 the conclusions we, we reached. Um, technically, we have many things, and uh, Michael showed uh, that uh, it's still progressing. But basically, uh, we have a lot of elements already uh, at our disposal. So, uh, we we have uh, IoTs, we have uh, inverter-based, uh, uh, let's say, IoTs with PV panels and batteries potentially. Um, we have communications. Uh, and some level of uh, local computing or edge computing. The question is, uh, what would you like to afford? Um, and we, we experimented with, um, uh, in a number of places, in some cases, you, you can have many different devices more or less connected. What you do need uh, to create uh, some um, uh, local energy management is uh, some active uh, assets like PV or, or batteries, uh, but not necessarily in every home that you want to manage. Uh, but at least you need to have uh, smart meters or uh, sensors that uh, make old uh, analog meter into uh, uh, smart meters. And uh, uh, often you need some local uh, computation capabilities. One important thing is to realize that the installation of all those equipments is not trivial at all. And uh, you usually end up uh, with a typically four hours setting of uh, uh, additional batteries or uh, additional sensors. Uh, and that is uh, uh, a, a very important feature for the future uh, of the operations. You also have to care about uh, your architecture uh, uh, in terms of uh, data collection and management, you will find different situations. Uh, consumers that are only consumers, they have nothing, but they still want to have a, a special relationship with uh, you through a energy community, for instance, or local energy management scheme. Uh, you have prosumers that have uh, uh, only uh, PV, others have uh, PV and batteries. And uh, as uh, uh, Miguel uh, mentioned, you you do need, I call it a data access point manager, which is the uh, uh, equivalent of the bus um, that was mentioned before. And then you, you can think about uh, various uh, layers, which you can organize into various markets which can be provided by uh, one or different parties as long as the uh, interfaces are uh, taken care of. Now, <clears throat> we, we did experiment uh, a number of uh, the technical solutions from the, uh, the, the simplest to the most sophisticated. Uh, uh, one of the <laughs> lessons is uh, you can do things very cheap and not, not too complicated, for instance, uh, providing interfaces with uh, Raspberry Pi uh, based gateways that led to, for me, for us uh, anyway, to about typically 7% of data losses. And um, then you just need to think whether those losses are acceptable for your uh, activity. 
in our case, it was not necessarily random losses. Uh, it was more disconnection for a period of one or two days, uh, and, and the rest was quite uh, reliable, which means that um, you lose one or two participants all the time uh, within your community, uh, and that might not be uh, a, a bad thing. Uh, but if, of course, if you look for uh, providing uh, uh, frequency regulation services, uh, you might not want to opt for that, uh, that simple gateway. You need a much more reliable uh, uh, setup, which typically would cost installed $500, uh, for instance. And then the question is, what kind of business activity, business model can support that kind of investment? Uh, and and, uh, and there are many options again uh, you you can uh, sell or lease the hardware you 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 can call third party uh, installers um, you can use uh, proprietary or open source solutions you can do a lot what we experimented uh, uh, was a kind of the simplest business model uh, you could think of is simply extending self-consumption and home energy uh, optimization on a single home into a collective self-consumption uh, and providing additional proportion of self-consumption. But uh, even in this uh, simplest uh, business model, you end up with a, a lot of interactions uh, a, a lot of contract and uh, 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 transactions uh, involved with money or, or data. The uh, the main uh, learning that we got is that, in fact, this simple business model of uh, collective cell consumption allows you to improve the uh, 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 proportion of uh, energy that is uh, consumed locally. Uh, uh, from 40 typically to 65%. And the additional gain that you obtain uh, by uh, managing collectively all those clients is, is not necessarily a lot in terms of um, uh, dollars or euros. And, and you need adaptation to the grid fee scratcher maybe, uh, or you need to combine that additional value with other value that you create because you have created a community. And so you must move transversely, horizontally into uh, other types of services. And that brings us to the questions of uh, how you engage customers uh, uh, and how you prepare for commercial scalability. And, uh, and here, here you, you have the uh, usual uh, uh, information feedback needs or uh, tricks about gamification. Um, you have to provide trust, but also you have to think about how to scale automatically by uh, providing ways of uh, viral expansion uh, from customer to customer almost without your uh, being involved into any marketing effort, for instance. So social networking is, is, uh, is important there. And we experimented with a simple uh, UX or a human machine interface, providing nudges, providing information about uh, its own uh, activity uh, in one single home and its role uh, into the community, providing some um, rewards with uh, points accumulated for good behavior, meaning consumption or production at the right time uh, for the community, which means for the grid as well. The, the main learning here is the, 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 the main issue really uh, with customer is to explain and present the share, the, the fair share of value creation. Uh, any doubt about the, the distribution of value creation uh, ruins your efforts. Uh, uh, we, you can do that using a market mechanisms uh, uh, if you want. It's not necessarily uh, always the case, but that allows 
uh, a sensation of uh, fairness uh, if you are allowed to if you are able sorry to educate uh, all your customer with uh, those market mechanisms one one small anecdote is um, in one of the experiment we allowed the customer to opt out uh, for many reasons including legal reasons uh, uh, not forcing anything on, on the, any particular customer and we had uh, again this uh, number seven percent of um, uh, not available uh, capacity or flexibility capacity in the case uh, that was well that meant that uh, if you wanted to offer a hundred kilowatt uh, or uh, uh, flexibility at any one point you you had to connect with 107 kilowatt of course to to be sure to uh, uh, provide what you promised to the grid or the the, the market uh, and that number was reduced to uh, virtually zero if you just include some kind of gaming uh, to the point that uh, when we had a, a technical glitch and uh, a customer was uh, disconnected, he was calling us, uh, accusing us to uh, not letting him giving, uh, uh, having the chance to participate and win uh, the, the, uh, the reward. So uh, you can do a lot with uh, very few uh, features of your uh, uh, platform or software. So all this shows that uh, you, you, you can uh, uh, do a lot of things today. Uh, you have to adjust for the, the profit and you have to think uh, a lot about how to transform uh, uh, technical capabilities into real offers that customers will uh, will accept. Um, in a nutshell, we are convinced, of course, and we are working in that direction, that uh, local energy management in one way or another uh, will very soon be the norm rather than the exception in any energy supply uh, contract. It will be aggregation or energy community ready. As um, it, it has started to be uh, a green and renewable already. So with this, I will uh, stop here and uh, welcome your questions. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, another very interesting presentation. Um, I, uh, I read an announcement from RISCOP, and this is about the cooperative energy saying by 2050, 37% of the renewables will come from cooperatives or things that we might call maybe energy uh, communities. Um, and energy community is a, now a task force that have been set up at the European Commission, where there is uh, probably 10 different categories of what we would call energy community. So for, for instance, there is like people who invest some money and uh, that's it uh, into renewables, which could be for a, a community uh, that is uh, also what you are presenting there is uh, also a models where you could have any customer who say i could be the facilitator of the energy community if i can give an image with the hotspots uh, for example uh, when you have a wireless connection somebody could say i i would i would become like the hotspot and then you can plug yourself on my on on me and then uh, uh, share what he has from prosuming for example from renewables with the others and you have players, uh, one of them is a member of the working group four called Greencom Networks, who have uh, a full platform solution as well for the energy communities. So this is really an interesting topic. Now, my understanding from what you said is, uh, Ra, the model is much more interesting when it comes to prosuming, if an individual prosumer uh, joined forces with the others, and uh, and then uh, having a much stronger profitability or voice being like a hundred prosumers together rather than an individual prosumer and, and this is what you 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 tested here with this model uh, yes in a sense uh, you you're right but i would add that uh, if you only have uh, prosumers uh, you will run into problems as well because you will have a a period of time with uh, excess production so what you you do need is a is a balanced community or set of uh, customer um, acting coherently i mean uh, 
I'm, I'm making the distinctions between community uh, uh, because it gives the sense of belonging to some uh, uh, organization or even institution and uh, collective behavior that is managed by maybe a third party through for instance the platform that you mentioned anyway what you look for is uh, uh, very complementarity between uh, members of uh, that community if you only have producers you have a problem you need to have if you only have consumers <laughs> you have a problem you you need people to consume during the day when the prosumers that are not at home, not consuming, uh, are, are, are nevertheless producing when there is sun at midday. So even you need uh, a mix between uh, uh, in residential customers and uh, uh, at least small commercial customers that consume during the day, basically. Yeah, yeah. This is why the platform I was speaking about should combine different. Uh, software solutions, for example, one which is for flexibility, another one for billing, another one for IoT and so on, and uh, the smart metering. So the combination of these will, will manage what you are talking about is uh, while some consumers are not at, at home and prosuming, others should be consuming. Otherwise, you get into a problem of excess generation versus the, the demand. It's an interesting topic. Now, the categories you are talking about are uh, like a, a building where you have, I don't know, 20, uh, 20 tenants, for example. Uh, is it an agricultural land where you have also farmers, for example, and they build an energy community from solar panels there or a wind turbine? So, so what are the, 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 the configurations here you, you looked at? We looked at... Um communities of one type you mentioned, which is the uh, collective um, uh, investment into a fairly large production asset uh, uh, on the side of uh, a village, for instance. Uh, okay. Uh, that, that's one option. And uh, it's this, this is quite simple. Uh, uh, because it's just a rich, like it's like a, a common investment and equity uh, sharing. Um, the more complicated uh, option that we uh, tested is the uh, uh, neighbors in one street that uh, uh, all need to, let's say, agree on a scheme of a redistribution of a value created, um, and. Uh, they are mathematical models that are totally exact uh, uh, and that are totally non-understandable by uh, people and therefore uh, uh, pro uh, producing a lot of questions. Uh, the, the, the simplest way is to slice the day uh, in 15 or 10 minutes interval and see who is con producing and who is consuming at uh, any one moment and rewarding people uh, uh, on their marginal effect on the, let's say, equilibrium of the, the load curve of the, the total uh, community, for instance. And, and then the, the third one uh, is the, uh, let's say, the vertical community within the uh, apartment building, for instance, with a single asset on the roof or, again, on the side of uh, uh, in the street. Um, it is different, not for technical reason, it is different for uh, uh, business uh, uh, involvement because there you you have usually intermediaries, uh, uh, yeah. owner of the apartments, and so on. Yeah, the co-property co or the syndicate of the property is different. Or social housing. Uh, social housing facilities manager. Facilities managers, yeah. So, any, so oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Sorry. So, so any question from Mark, Etienne, uh, or Miguel? I think Mark had a question. Yeah, I, I had a question just in terms of uh, the relationship between aggregators that would be directly interfacing with resources at the customer and community level and how they would coordinate or maybe it's, you know, maybe the retailer is an aggregator, but uh, the, the relationship between the aggregator and the retailer 
in uh, offering services to DSO and DSO. And I know that DSO flexibility service is kind of new. Denmark has a market for that. But uh, how does Anji feel about, you know, the relationship between the retailer and the aggregator in, in connecting to these distributed resources? This, um, uh, there are different roles uh, that must be uh, played, uh, and they can be played by either uh, different uh, entities or the same entity can play uh, uh, more than one role. Um, so that means that the interfaces uh, must be set up and uh, uh, quite explicit. We are quite fortunate in a sense that in France, where we, we did some experiments, uh, the, the regulator forced uh, us to consider that uh, each individual uh, participant to a uh, community had to have the right to contract with a, 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 its own preferred retailer, right? So in other words, I'd say it differently. Uh, it's not because you set up an energy community that uh, automatically you become the sole uh, retailer for that community. And that forced us to immediately uh, imagine that we could play a role of a community manager, uh, helping the different customers according to their uh, technical sophistication or or, or market uh, readiness, um, and, and still provide information uh, to the DSO. Uh, and uh, so that uh, in this case in France, the DSO can relate what happened within the community to the different retailers so that uh, uh, the difference between uh, local production and uh, the, the, the rest of the electricity need uh, could be uh, correctly calculated. In a sense, in France, the, this kind of community is essentially taking the readings from the meters and correcting those readings according to any kind of rule that the energy community has uh, agreed uh, uh, collectively to set up to take into account uh, the activity of, uh, of its members. And therefore, um, uh, each member of the community only pays uh, uh, to the retailer what is left uh, to, to be paid. Um, um, I, I, overall, of course, uh, the Kirchhoff laws are always the same. Uh, uh, the, the decisions of uh, value sharing within the community doesn't change what enters or leaves the community uh, in terms of energy. So the retailers are, are not affected. Um, but to, to, so to come back to your question, uh, we, we believe that uh, uh, the different actors need to take into account the different uh, potential interactions and interfaces. And, in, and, and the very important interface, of course, is uh, with the DSO. And uh, that might have been one of my questions to Mike Miguel is about uh, what kind of provision in terms of uh, API interfaces, for instance. His project has uh, imagined uh, to, to, to have um, support from community managers or aggregators or market operators if um, if the local uh, exchanges are managed through market mechanisms so i think i might come in for a second since it is, is a question it's funny you say that because yes as part of the sanio project we have to find a set of apis to allow to gain access to, to aggregators and, and actors like that into the, the types of data information to, in order to be able to do this. So this is something we have considered through the Sanyo project and are looking to reuse through our EdgeFlex project. Yeah, and this is part of the network code as well, where you have this flexibility marketplace where the TSOs and DSOs plug in and where the through this flexibility marketplace you connect as well to the aggregators so so we ng are not looking at uh, becoming the the sole player around communities uh, uh, 
we might have to adjust, uh, for instance, if uh, uh, open source, very good open source, I would say, uh, uh, technology stacks uh, emerge that uh, becomes adopted for one reason or another by uh, by many users. Uh, in that case, we we would need to become a, a helper around those uh, uh, solutions, uh, and 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 stop maybe our own developments into uh, uh, a platform uh, supplier. Okay. It doesn't matter. I mean, what, what we want is to service our customers and help them make the most of their assets. Or... Okay. Look, Etienne, I need, I need to jump to, to Peter, but I, I think that was very interesting. I will come back to you. Maybe I will leave you with a question. You can take the time to think about it when we will come at the end of the dialogue. Is that now like an established business? Is that a big business for NG or not? But you know, reserve your answer to later on. Peter, uh, then uh, you are the head of the digital hub at Vattenfall, and I guess you will be speaking about the strategy and demonstrations uh, that are uh, providing the foundation for the digital grid at Vattenfall. So you have like 10 minutes, uh, and uh, hopefully we can still have time at the end for a dialogue. Thank you very much uh, for the introduction. Uh, yes, that's correct. Uh, I'm uh, working for Vattenfall, specifically Vattenfall Distribution. <coughs> Sorry uh, about that. Uh, and just to give a, a heads up on, on, on Vattenfall, it, it's uh, a company acting in, in the Northern Europe, uh, in all parts of the value chain. But Vattenfall Distribution, in, in specific, uh, is operating a grid in, in uh, the northern part of, of uh, northern half part of, of, of Sweden, basically, basically, and in Berlin. Uh, we also have some uh, network in the UK. Um, so I won't spend more time about Vattenfall, but this really sets the, the, the scene, and, and, and it is, of course, also affecting the uh, challenges we are facing when addressing uh, our uh, area in the future needs of, of our society. Uh, I won't, will go into our strategy. I will go about the different parts of our, our digitalization uh, the distribution business. Uh, but before going into what uh, we are doing, I, I, I would like to, to mention a few words about something what's different now than before. Uh, the evolution of, of, of our energy system has always always happened. It is nothing new. There has been big challenges before. Uh, there is new areas for certain. But the major difference for now uh, that we haven't seen before is the difference of time. Everything goes so much quicker right now. Uh, we are seeing demands from society uh, going uh, in a that we haven't seen before. You are building new houses in just a few months. You're establishing solar uh, farms in, in 30 days. Uh, in, in, a, in a space that's not really seen before as part of, of the evolution of, of the energy system. And uh, our, I think the, before going into a lot of the what's that, that, that we are still uh, struggling with, of course, and there is no clear solution, I do think we need to keep in mind that, that our, our real, real challenge here is time. We need to match the need from society in the evolution of, of our energy system, electricity, electrical system, uh, meeting the sustainable goals. And, and uh, it needs to be done in a pace that we haven't really seen before. Uh, so uh, now uh, looking, uh, I see something happening happened with the slides. Uh, I don't know, could I get some, I don't know why the slide is looking as they are. Formatting maybe PC Macintosh, something like that? Yeah, there, yeah. I, I, I will move on. I, I guess most of the text is still there. Um, uh, Basically, our strategy for addressing the, the uh, digitalization of our DSO is, is oriented around four topics. It, it, it's on one hand, the digital grid, and, and for the digital grid, we are, we are seeing things like, like digitalization of our, our uh, substations. We have the low voltage uh, 
monitoring, uh, going uh, all the way to the to the delivery point for the customers. We have IoT systems, and like just to give an example from other Europe, we we have the ice buildup uh, around our lines that that in just 10 years has drastically changed due to climate change and, and it puts a completely new uh, demand on understanding how the ice builds up. And, and uh, we have microgrids uh, uh, that as a, a new tool, which of course you can see that, that energy communities are some point building up, but independent of that, we were seeing connected microgrids being uh, increased at a drastic uh, pace. Uh, and the, the change behavior of these microgrids is, of course, changing uh, the needs from the, the overall grid. Uh, so, and then we have the digital worker. Uh, the, the work environment for, for our uh, both uh, office workers, but also field workers, uh, is drastically changing. We are getting uh, the support of, of, for instance, drones. We have the virtual reality or augmented reality that, that helps us get uh, efficiency in our process to, to a degree that, that we haven't seen before. Um, in the data analysis that, that support our workers are, are, are for the AI uh, support uh, increasing. Um, you can see that, that we are basically moving away from, from uh, an, an old-fashioned way of doing maintenance to, to go into not only condition-based maintenance, but also preventive maintenance, which is a completely new level uh, of, of doing maintenance, of, of being proactive. Uh, and we have the tool of, of, of uh, uh, a digital twin, even if that is just in its early phases. I, I strongly think that the, uh, the possibility to, to actually create a digital version of your grid creates uh, enormous possibilities to, to understand what, what's really happening in the media, future demand. Uh, so apart from the digital grid and the digital worker, we can look also at the digital customer. And, and in that area, we can see uh, uh, new demands of, of, or new needs for, for tariffs. Uh, of course, the tariff setting is different from country to country. In Sweden, we have the luxury actually being able to uh, set our tariffs ourselves. There is, of course, some boundaries, but, but, but uh, basically we can decide the structure and, and, and uh, the layout of the tariffs by ourselves. Uh, I know that's not a luxury in all countries, but, but it, of course, gives possibilities. Uh, we have had for, for 15 years smart meters roll out 100% in Sweden. Uh, uh, we have the earlier first generation of the meters. We have all the values. We are now going down to the possibility to five minutes values with the, the rollout just happening as we speak. Uh, but we are seeing that is not enough meeting the future. For, for certain customers, not even five minutes values is really uh, sufficient to be able to, to, to support uh, the needs uh, in the new energy system. So we are talking about real-time metering, not for all customers, but, but there is something we need to manage. Um, the electrification of the transport sector is another one. Uh, electrical roads uh, is, is a great challenge. The indic indicative uh, demands are huge. Uh, and of course, then we have the direct cus customer dialogue talking about new digital channels, uh, voice bots using your Siri or Google Home or whatever to, to actually communicate with your, your utility uh, verbally. Uh, the final part, uh, and of course, that needs to be digital as well, so digital dis business models. Maybe that is, is not as easy to understand, but you can translate it to flexibility. Here we are seeing the increase of use of bilateral contracts for demand and generation. We are seeing the test. Uh, we are running a couple of tests uh, in different parts of Sweden with local markets, the local capacity markets, services from energy storage is, is increasing in a, in a rapid speed. Uh, but we can also see flexibility created from, from uh, a changed view of risk uh, or, or preferably reduced risk in, in operating your network. That could actually create dynamics. Uh, and finally, uh, to some degree, there is also the possibility to use local uh, generation. So all of this is, is pointing out uh, areas where, where our strategy takes us, where we are doing in some parts innovation and some parts implementation uh, at the moment. Um, just to give two examples, uh, I will. Uh, uh, we can see 
on the on the left hand side the 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 low voltage monitoring i think being well in the way of the 21st century our customers really expecting to know what service we are delivering to them and and they don't expect that they need to call us if they have problems which you know um, and, and this tool for, for, for six years now has put, put it fully in, into operation using, of course, the, the smart meters to get uh, the, the knowledge all the way to the delivery point at the customer site. And, and what we're using is, is uh, uh, the events coming. And, and, and we are talking about between one to five events on average uh, per customer per day. So we're talking about millions of, event, of events that, that actually the our operation center should act upon. Of course, that requires some analytics and some AI in order to be manageable. Uh, but the benefits are quite huge. Uh, the trust uh, is, is increasing. We have uh, uh, an improved, of course, quality of service, we're finding problems faster. And there is a safety aspect also you can identify by, by, by moving, uh, getting your data basically all the way to the delivery. Another example is, is forest clearing. We have a lot of overhead lines uh, that requires uh, clearing of, of forest around the, the line. And, and this is just an example of automating an existing process uh, where we today is, is, is collecting 2D, 3D laser scanning and camera graphics of, of all our lines. Uh, and and uh, we're not doing it yearly, uh, every, every part of the line, but we are doing 13,000 kilometers per year uh in 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 uh, data collection uh, uh, and this covers areas with, with 100,000 real estate owners that need to be interacted with and 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 in total just to give a rough figure we're talking about around 100 terabytes a day um this is something of course that 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 you need a digitalization of your process in order to an automation of your process in order to 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 be efficient uh and and, and now I know the pictures are very small, uh, but it's just an example of our, our system where, where uh, the AI is, is automatically identifying trees that need to be cut. Uh, it even outlines the route uh, the field worker needs to take to get to each individual tree in the most efficient way and how we can dispose of a cut down tree. Uh, this is maybe the, the, the simple parts of the digitalization. Uh, you take something you already are doing and you do it more efficiently by digitalization. You are slightly extending it uh, in some way. Uh, what, what's the big, the more new part of this is, is going into the flexibility, which is really uh, a big game changer, I would say, for, for uh, the energy system and something that is going to be a real struggle for, for different stakeholders, not only for the DSO, but the, the, the uh, the all the stakeholders, including the customers, uh, making this uh, not only possible to do in single ex uh, uh, pilots or demonstration, but also on a wide scale. Uh, but before going into to, uh, uh, one of the examples showing, okay, where are the challenges? I, I do want to uh, um, uh, about flexibility, and because that's not uncomplicated at all. Um, uh, I think when most people are referring to flexibility, they are really thinking about the market-based flexibility. They are talking about demand response programs. They are talking about uh, somebody uh, uh, buying services uh, from an energy storage, for instance. So it's, it's, it's market-based. It's something there is a market actor that needs uh, the, or possibly uh, also a, a market platform that you're acting uh, with. Some, of course, you can also include bilateral contracts instead of a more open market. But I think that's most what people mean when they talk about flexibility. But for the DSO, this is not the only flexibility that's available and being chosen from. Uh, we have the two other types of flexibility that, that has the equal value for the DSO, but it's not connected to the market. Uh, one is the connection-based flexibility, and, and here we are talking about connection agreements where there could be limitations in certain requirements. Uh, that makes completely sense. Uh, uh, but there is also the, the part of the tariffs. The tariffs in itself, of course, there are some limitations. You can't change it, uh, uh, at least not the structure, every day or every month. But, but still, it, it's a, a, a slow moving maybe, but it's still 
a, a type of flexibility that is not going really to the market, but is still affecting the available flexibility. And the final part of, of flexibility is not involving the customer at all, uh, or not even all, uh, involving the market at all, and that's more the technical flexibility. And, and a, a very typical example of technical flexibility is you change the risk level, your operation network. Uh, it's not an on-off. It's not that you go to a certain level and then, then and you run it on that level, and then it's something just slightly, a, a, a small kilowatt uh, is added, everything breaks, uh, breaks down. We are operating the, the, the grid, of course, from, from, uh, uh, with a safety margin, but with increased knowledge about our network, with increased uh, sensors and, and data collections and calculations around this, we can, of course, given certain scenarios, run the network uh, closer to, to its safety margin. And that is a, 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 an available flexibility that's dependent on the, on the risk appetite of you as well. It's not involving the customer. So uh, all of this is need to keep in mind um, when, when, when talking about flexibility. Not everything is market-based flexibility. Um, now, um, next slide is, is really the best slide I've ever seen, uh, the best slide ever created. I haven't done it, so I can't take any credit for, for it, but it's, I'm still reusing it uh, because I think it's so great showing the challenges we have with flexibility. And, and that's not only market-based flexibility, but all types of flexibility that that we are currently facing. Uh, this is a, a slide coming from uh, the EU project. Now I see the logo for the uh, project has disappeared, but it's, it's from the EU project coordinates, uh, an interesting uh, project that, that's looking into uh, enabling local flexibility platforms. Um, and and uh, uh, but the interesting part about this is, is that when you're looking at the marketplace as such, uh, where you actually are trading the flexibility. This, this is the circle in the middle of this slide. And of course, that's important that you need to have an interface to it and, and it shouldn't be uh, marginalized. Uh, it, it is important, but it's just a small part. Because what needs to happen in order for flexibility to be usable before getting to, if it's a platform or a, a connection agreement or a, or, a, or a technical flexibility that you want to use. Well, there is a lot of arrows uh, going into that uh, circle in the middle. Uh, looking on the left-hand side, you can see it from the, from the DSO perspective. Uh, you, you need to start, okay, can we do flexibility planning? If the tools is just built in your department that you actually can plan your network uh, with the, with the uh, with uh, flexibility as an integral part. Um, I can't speak for every company, but I, I, I can say for, for us, it's a real struggle to get that into something that, that's usable and, and something that you can risk mitigate. Um, then you, of course, also have the operating flexibility. When it's, when it's built, can you operate your network uh, with flexibility? This is a new way of operating your network, uh, which is custom to, to, to just work with your, your existing uh, uh, network, the grid, the copper network to, 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 to do this. Uh, but in order for them to, to actually be successful, we come to one of the most important things that's happening right now, that's possibility to grid, do grid forecasting. How can you forecast your, your grid? Here, there is a lot of projects uh, going on throughout the world, throughout Europe. Uh, there is a lot of projects uh, or, or companies involved into this, but you need to get something practically workable uh, in order to do the first forecast. And finally, when you go into, uh, and now you're getting closer to the market, you need, of course, the coordination with other network companies here and the TSO specifically. That's coming from the, from the left-hand side. From the right-hand side, it's, it's, it's basically the same, but now we're coming in from the customer side. Uh, it's not a given that, that the customer knows its own processes when we are talking about uh, or industry knows their own processes when we're commenting, what in, how flexible are you? This is a journey they need to take. Uh, so they need to understand what type of flexibility product is really working for us. Uh, what can we do? How can we commit with a lower risk? Forecasting is also a part of them. They need to forecast, okay, where, how can we optimize our uh, key processes in order uh, to deliver on what we actually, are, why we actually exist but we also see, can we make money out of being flexible? And then uh, finally, going closer to this, okay, when, when this is actually happening, when we had the products defined, when we know the forecast, 
we also, of course, need a way that we can verify that and we're coming into yeah. real time. Peter, we, we have uh, for the whole session like five minutes left. I don't know, Mark, if we can take more more time uh, beyond the 6.30 uh, here, CAT. Uh, but I would like to keep some time for also some questions and, and maybe a bit of dialogue. For, for sure. And, and the good part is that was my last slide. So I'm ready. <laughs> Okay, thank you. So um, let let me maybe ask a question, and then it's going to be an open question to to everyone. What is the driver behind the uh, three digital example projects that you are presenting here? Where where the starting point was? Um, was it uh, happening in the grid team? Was it uh, coming like a top down? Was there like a pain point? Or did we need for every one of these cases to justify the business case? Of course, the first one was in Ireland, was a European funded project, Horizon 2020, and so on. Uh, but still, you need also to explain why we need to do this project. So may maybe, Peter, you can. I, I, yeah. Yeah, if I, can, I can start. I, I, th I think, uh, um, of course, each individual project shows up from with different drivers and, and, and from different origins. But I think overarching for this is that you can always trace it back that we have a society and customers that, that is moving in an increased speed with new demands. Uh, and and I, I think that it, it's, it's society and customers that's really putting new demands on, on the electricity and the energy business as such. So, and, and, and for me, this is, this feels good. Uh, it's really uh, uh, those that, that really should use uh, the system we are creating that, that is actually putting the demands and saying, okay, you need to improve, you need to pace up. Uh, I have a data center I want to connect it. I can't wait three years to get that connected. I need to be able to connect it in much quicker time. So I think, I think this society and customers that's really driving this uh, uh, when you're looking real, from yeah. where is this coming? Thanks. What about Miguel and, and uh, Etienne? Well, funny enough, uh, Mahar, I, I'm going to agree with Peter. Um, I mean, very much in agreement with, with, with what he's just mentioned. I mean, obviously, we had a practical uh, driver again when it came to the, the complexity in the network and for diesel to be able to look at it. But uh, again, just looking at how you can, if you get better visibility of the grid, what will that mean about flexibility? And then the, the social and the the market forces that are now bringing that onto the market and, and and dso's having to be quicker in that responsive being able to open up their data just to say i saw there was a couple of questions in the q a section asking about how open was the data available say for sanyo how open was it to others outside of uh, just the utility themselves and, and certainly that's what we're also driving to because you have to be able to provide that data to other people to be able to deliver on all the services in this flexible world. So, um, yeah, that, that's certainly what we found as we've transitioned through the years and through the projects. In our case, um, being more retailer than, than as I said, the DSO, it's uh, quite simple. It's the differentiation uh, uh, with respect to other retailers. Uh, the, the, um, the old digitalization allows us to provide uh, services to smaller and smaller customers that we used to uh, provide uh, already for many years to, to big customers, meaning, for instance, um, uh, energy services uh, aiming at uh, uh, um, lowering energy bills uh, and um, uh, energy saving commitments and things like that. So that starts with uh, home energy management and uh, energy uh, optimization, and and very quickly you 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 try to grab a few more percent of efficiency. Uh, I mean uh, invoice efficiency, <laughs> and, and therefore you you start um, uh, suggesting to group people together and create communities because it's even more efficient and so okay. on and so on. So okay. uh, 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 yeah. Thank yeah, you. Uh, but, uh, so, so another question. Uh, and uh, EPRI is like a global organization. We might have people as well in the U.S. attending the call. Um, wh what do you believe in these topics that were presented, like local energy community, 
uh, the model uh, which is interesting for uh, for retailers the uh, flexibility definition and all the projects that Vattenfall is doing smart metering and so on and also uh, the 5G and the grid uh, project are we more advanced than in the US we have best practices here uh, are they replicable as well to the US for example when it comes to hurricane and then predicting the storms and so on with analytic solution of course if you go to florida next era has also a lot of these needs so tell me uh, who is more advanced than others and who can learn from others between europe and the us well if i as i start i think we all can learn from each other uh, into this i think it's dangerous to say that that uh, on general that one part of the world is more advanced than the other because i don't think it's true i think for Certain parts, uh, there is uh, maybe Europe or even certain countries in Europe that is, that is really ahead the rest of the world. I, I'm, I'm pretty sure and, uh, and certain that there is other areas where the U.S. is, is ahead. Uh, so I don't think you can you can speak generally. Uh, okay. Are, are you cooperating with uh, U.S. utilities, for example, on some topics? Uh, that there is an exchange, yes, uh, for certain topics, yes, and I, I think that that's the way you, you need to do because that it's uh, um, in many cases it, it's also there is different priorities. Uh, there's different parts that's more more important for us. Is for instance is is the weather uh, uh, affecting our our headlines. That that's really something struggling. But but within within the Wasserfall as company uh, going to Berlin where we offer this network where we basically do, do not have any overhead lines at all, uh, this is uh, for sure not a, a, a major challenge and their priorities are, sure. are different. So I think that sure. could be copied to Yeah, to, yeah. so definitely the vegetation it. detection, it's an interesting use case everywhere, huh? what you have done here at Vattenfall for like 13,000 kilometers, that's uh, uh, interesting in Scandinavian countries, interesting in uh, in Portugal, in Greece, uh, in Italy, uh, also a lot of places, a lot of states in the United States. Yeah. Um, Miguel? Yeah. Uh, I, I, again, um, uh, there was just one additional point um, that, that uh, and, uh, there is a question in there about, um, you know, uh, the fact that market, market settlement is happening days, if not, not weeks afterwards. And again, a key thing for me in all of this in, in sharing the data and open data it, it is having access to real-time data essentially you know look given the amount of renewables that we're going to be bringing in as well and you know look we, we are also collaborating with with people in in the us around this so again maybe just to address maybe your question i think being able to host these webinars and being able to share in this way and being able to share across uh, the atlantic between both sides i think we'll both learn from some progress that we can make towards this digital grid Okay, and Etienne? Well, we, we are uh, present in the United States. We have a commercial operation there. We, for instance, manage uh, uh, university campuses, which we consider as a local energy community uh, because there are uh, various buildings with various functions and, and different uh, departments uh, most of the time, so they, 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 they can be cons uh, considered uh, as uh, individual customers anyway. So um, the regulation is different, uh, but we, we, we do microgrid management and the energy community over there as well. Yeah, well, I can say, for example, on the standardization of the smart grids, there was a good cooperation between Sense and like Etsy who were working on the mandate um, uh, for 90, which is the standardization of the smart grids in Europe closely with NIST. NIST were part of the committee, for example, and permanently exchanging uh, their standardization experience in the US with what was done in uh, Europe. And, and definitely there is a lot of global solutions when it comes to SCADA and so on that are being implemented worldwide as well with some tailoring here and there to consider the market structure, for instance. And of course, the flexibility solutions, I mean, Enel, for example, has acquired an American company when it comes to demand response management and flexibility as well. So there is, a, 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 of course, a, a space uh, for cooperation, particularly in the digitalization of the grids. Uh, and honestly, I learned a lot uh, today as well from these presentations. There was not overlap. These were different topics and involving different stakeholders as well. 
uh, and uh, I, I think uh, the audience who attended the session today uh, can reach out to you. We have your contacts here and uh, uh, continue. If there are uh, space for cooperation or for questions, continue directly. Uh, from myself, thank you again for uh, IPRI and with the help of Stanford here to organize uh, this uh, session. Uh, it was uh, very interesting for me and I hope it was also uh, interesting for the audience. Maybe I leave it to uh, Mark and Omar to close the session. Thanks a lot, Mihir. Three great perspectives, uh, very interesting to me personally and I'm sure everyone got a lot out of it. So thanks for that and um, I think there's gonna, we're going to make this a, a, a continuous dialogue with uh, with an ongoing series of, of discussions. So I hope we have an opportunity to continue the collaboration across the ocean as you kind of headed us down that path, Mayor. Thanks a lot. Thank you. And uh, with that, let, let's uh, let's close. Uh, fantastic session. Thank you, Mayer, uh, Etienne, Miguel, Peter. Uh, we will post uh, this we webinar recording and presentation um, once it is um, set up and we will send information to all the registrants as we said earlier. And um, if you can, uh, we have our third of this week's webinar series tomorrow at the same start time. So we invite you to join us for that and our continued um, webinar series into the summer. So on behalf of, of uh, Stanford, uh, Fitz and Watts Initiative, EPRI, our uh, esteemed moderator and distinguished panelists, thank you so much. Have a great rest of the day. Thank you. And stay safe. Thank you, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Thank you.